Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. Perhaps you've heard about attachment styles and how your attachment style can have a huge impact on your relationship. But I definitely don't want you to feel like you're a victim to your attachment style or if you're in a relationship to the attachment style of your partner. So in the off chance that you or someone you love has one of the main insecure attachment styles, which can cause a lot of problems in a relationship, today I would like to talk about what a healthy relationship can look like no matter what kind of attachment style you have. And along with that, I want you to be able to tell if your relationship realistically has the potential to improve or not. And we'll also get into why your attachment style can have such a big impact and what to do about it. So that's all on today's show. First, I just want to remind you that Relationship Alive is my offering to you so that you can hopefully have the most successful, thriving relationships possible. If you are finding the show to be helpful, then please consider a donation to ensure that we can continue. Every little bit counts and you can choose whatever feels right to you. All you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And this week I would like to thank Jules, Dion, Sarah, Cynthia, Julie, Maribeth, Laura, Sarah, Dave, Michael, and Elizabeth. Thank you all so much for your generous and in many cases ongoing support of Relationship Alive. Now, as you might imagine, the way to improve your relationship also often involves improving your communication, especially if you're trying to talk about issues that relate to your attachment styles. So I have a couple ways to help you with the communication in your relationship. The first is my free guide to my top three relationship communication tips. These are three simple things that you can put into practice that will have a huge impact on your ability to stay connected no matter how challenging the thing is that you're talking about. All you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash relate, or you can text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions to get this free guide. So if you haven't gotten it yet, what are you waiting for? Download it. Uh, also, I've put together a course called The Secrets of Relationship Communication. And this course is over three hours of material that is broken into bite-sized chunks that you can digest 10 minutes at a time. And it's all focused on the ways that you can improve the communication in your relationship. So it's not focused on improving your partner, it's all the leverage points that you have where you can exert influence over the way that you communicate and the results that you get. Hopefully feeling more understood, closer intimacy, and working through conflicts that might be persisting in your relationship. So to grab the course, which is still in beta, and if you grab it now, you will also get the final version when that is available, just visit neilsatin.com slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E. And I just want to thank all of you who have signed up already for the course. Lastly, I just want to remind you that we have a Facebook group. Uh, called the Relationship Alive Community. So if you want to connect with other people who listen to the show and are interested in having healthy, successful, conscious relationships, uh, just come find us on Facebook and join the group. And uh, we're doing our best to create a safe space where you can talk about all things relationship and what is going on with yourself and also provide support for other people. All right, that's it. Let us get on with the show. So I wanted to talk a a bit about what relationships look like, and in particular, how to have a healthy relationship if you or your partner 
has an insecure attachment style. So I've had a few episodes about attachment styles and how they can impact your relationship. You can look through my episodes with Stan Tatkin or with Sue Johnson. So I'm going to be somewhat brief here in my overview um, and just say that if you have an anxious attachment style, then as things get out of balance in your relationship, you are more likely to lean in. You're more likely to want to seek out connection with your partner of any kind in order to bring yourself some stability, particularly in stressful or triggering times. If you have an avoidant attachment style, then pro somewhat problematically, you have the exact opposite response to things getting stressful or feeling triggering, which is that you want to get out of there. You want space to yourself. You want uh, time to think. And in fact, if you are paired with someone, as so often happens, who has an anxious attachment style, then you will perhaps feel overwhelmed by the amount that they're coming at you with all of their questions and emotions and requirements. And, and you'll just be like, get me out of here. Uh, on the flip side, if you are anxious and you're trying to seek connection from a partner who wants some distance and space, then you'll perceive that as really threatening. Uh, so the more that you lean in, the more that they'll lean away. And then that in and of itself will create problems. And you'll wonder, why, why won't they work with me? Why won't they listen to me? Why don't they want to understand what's going on with me? Uh, and you can see how... If two opposite attachment styles uh, pair up with each other, how it's a recipe for a lot of dysfunction to take place. Uh, and you've probably heard of the, the pursuer-distancer dynamic in a relationship, which is another manifestation of that sort of thing at play. And here's what's interesting. You, you can actually switch. So you could be... Uh, anxious in one relationship and in your next relationship you could be avoidant and here's another interesting thing if you have a secure attachment style at your at your base so you're good at feeling boundaried and taking care of your your own emotional needs and not making them dependent on someone else or being so heavily impacted by someone else that you can't hold space for their emotions um, that's a great place to be. And if you find yourself in relationship with another securely attached person, then um, it's not that you, I mean, you probably still do have issues of some sort, but those issues don't come from a lack of safety that you create for each other. You're, if you're two, two securely attached people, then you probably don't have too much trouble holding a safe container for whatever else is going to unfold. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that you won't have issues come up. Um, but the way that you work on those issues might be a lot different than people who operate from a place where they don't feel that sense of being able to, uh, to hold themselves in an emotionally charged environment and to... Uh, provide themselves the support that they need while still staying connected to another person. Um, because both of the insecure attachment styles that I described, uh, anxious and avoidant, or as Stan Tatkin calls them, uh, the, the anxious ones are waves and the avoidance are islands. Uh, the waves wanting to come at you over and over again, like waves lapping on the shore and the, and the islands wanting uh, to be alone and, and surrounded by, by a vast amount of water. The thing is that, that each of these people still wants connection. I mean, you wouldn't be in a relationship if you didn't, at least on some level, want connection and, and all the benefits that come along with connection. Uh, the challenge comes up with how you handle the stress of everyday life or situations. And so while an, an island, for instance, might feel like, oh, I've got, I've got me, like I've got me totally under control, um, 
the challenge for an island is to maintain that feeling while they are staying connected to their partner. And the challenge for the wave is maybe a little different. It's more like a dependence on the other person to help them feel okay. Um, and it can become really challenging uh, and and uh, alienating to, f to feel like you have to somehow take care of yourself when you are bumping up against something that's really challenging. So I don't want to forget where I was going with these securely attached people is that if you are in a relationship with someone who is insecurely attached, then you may find yourself being pushed to the opposite polarity um, in response to your partner. So you might wonder, wow, like in, in relationships past, this kind of thing has never been an issue for me. I've never felt like I've needed space quite so much, or I've never felt like I need to lean in quite so much. And those things can happen in response to the uh, however your partner is acting. Because you got to remember, as I've said many times on this show, relationships are a dance that is being done by the people in the relationship. So one of you moves a certain way and the other one is going to move correspondingly in a way that might be healthy or if pushed and pushed and pushed might become unhealthy and, and in fact might degenerate to a certain extent. So hopefully this discussion is going to be helpful for all of you um, who at some time or another, whether you're trying to make sense of a past relationship or the relationship that you're in or trying to be prepared for your next relationship, hopefully all of this will be helpful. Now, one important thing to remember is that the way that these descriptions of how we respond, so my desire to lean in or your desire to lean out or vice versa, it's all about mostly how we show up when we are under stress. So these kinds of things, even though they might still be there in a subtle way when there aren't problems going on, generally that won't feel problematic. And in fact, it may create like a really interesting chemistry between you and the other person. The, the kind of thing that draws you together in the first place. Um, and even if you're a securely attached person, you might be drawn to the, the somewhat distant island who you need to reach out to, to get. Or you might be, uh, feel the allure of, of a wave who's, who's really, really interested in you and wants to be in your space all the time. That might feel really good at first. So you can see how these dynamics actually are initially the perfect entree into some sort of relationship with another person. The problem arises when things get challenging because as you've heard me talk about on the show before, when you get triggered, you naturally go into this place that you've probably heard about called fight or flight or freeze. And what you might notice in this moment is that fight the desire to lean in in order to deal with uh, being triggered is a lot like an anxious attachment style. You're, you are leaning in, you're like a wave. And the flight response is a lot like someone with an avoidant attachment style, an island who needs to get away. So the key to having a healthier relationship when you or your partner or both of you is has an, one of these uh, other attachment styles is to first, as always, prioritize safety. Now, some people um, like Stan Tatkin and Sue Johnson um, for them, creating that safety is paramount in relationship. And generally, that's 
pretty true across the board of people who are trying to help others have better relationships. If you don't feel safe in your relationship, you need to prioritize making it safe and figuring out why things don't feel safe. And so if you are able to recognize in a challenging moment that you are feeling triggered and to take care of yourself and your partner so that you can come back to safety, then in those moments, it is likely that those attachment styles that we've been talking about will have less of an impact because they won't be dominating how you respond to your partner. There is a, a larger question, though, which is this question of how much of that dynamic you want to tolerate in your relationship. If you, whether you're an island or a wave, do you want to be in a relationship that over and over again makes you feel either overwhelmed or abandoned? Do you want that over and over and over again in your relationship? My guess is that probably you don't. Probably you don't want that. So there remains this question of how do you actually change your relationship so that you are not falling into those patterns of relating. This also gets at the question that a lot of us have when we're in those relationships, which is, is this feeling that I'm feeling, this feeling of discomfort, is this about me and work that I need to do or is this about my partner? Because whether you're an island or a wave, it's tempting to point the finger at your partner. If you need to be alone to process when things get intense and your partner is leaning in, leaning in and wants, wants more of you, then it's easy to look at your partner and say, whoa, like, what's your problem? Like, if you could just give me some space, then we could figure this out. And you won't give me space because you're a wave. You're an anxious attachment style person. And so that's your problem. Like, you got to handle your shit. And if you don't handle your shit, then, um, then this can't, I don't see how this could work, right? Because you're, you're freaking me out every time we have an, a fight about anything. Um, so that's how you might feel if you're an island, if you're more avoidant in how you handle challenging situations. On the other hand, if you're anxious or a wave, then you might... Um, you might be leaning in and leaning in and feel like, well, if only my partner would just figure out how to meet me, how to show up for me in these challenging situations, then we could get through this just fine. And yet they keep retreating and retreating. And I don't know if they'll ever be willing to show up for me. And so it's clearly their fault that this is going off the rails so often. If they could simply show up the way that I need them to, then then all would be well. So you can see how easy it is to identify an, the other person as the one who's to blame for the dynamic. And at the same time, as you probably are aware, our ability to get our partners to change is relatively limited, if it exists at all. And so the problem with identifying your partner as the person who's the cause of, this, of the discomfort that you're experiencing or the obstacles in your relationship is that it doesn't give you much control over changing anything. However, the flip side is also true. The flip side is true where perhaps you are asking the question, how do I know if this is my partner or if this is me? And that is a great question to be asking yourself. So no matter what your, no matter what attachment style you're bringing to this situation, it is always helpful to be able to step back and say, okay, how am I contributing to this? To what extent is this something that I'm creating versus something that my partner is creating? 
And this is really helpful because if you are an island, a more avoidant person, you might recognize like, oh, every time I step back to try and get space, that just seems to trigger my partner even more. I wonder what would happen if I didn't step back quite so far. What would I need in order for that to happen, et cetera, et cetera. You're on your way to a potential solution. Or if you're the wave, the person who leans in, you might recognize, oh, yeah, the more that I lean in, the more my partner pulls back and the more stirred up I get. So if I could just figure out how to not lean in so much, maybe I wouldn't push my partner away so much. You're on your way again to a potential solution. Now I'm saying potential solution for a reason because no matter what you do, you and you can do a lot to affect change within yourself and those changes affect the way that you participate in the dance of your relationship and they will impact your partner. However, there's something really crucial, a seasoning that you have to add to the mix so that you don't get stuck. You don't get stuck in a situation where you feel like, well, if this isn't really improving the way that I want it to, then it, it must be on me or it's on me to fix it. And your partner never learns how to, how to show up or truly change what they do. And, and you could find yourself just stuck for a long time in that pattern of relating, no matter what you try to do. Because as an example, um, if you, let's go with what we've been doing. If you're in a, an avoidant person, so you like to take space um, in challenging times, then uh, you might say, okay, so I'm going to stop trying to take as much space. I'm going to figure out how to lean in. Um, and there may also be ways for you, and maybe not lean in, maybe simply stay present, right? You don't necessarily have to lean all the way in, but you just got to stay there so that you can communicate and, and actually collaborate around solving whatever problem it is that you're dealing with. If you leave the room, so to speak, then you've lost the opportunity to actually collaborate with your partner on a solution. So great, you learn how to stay present and perhaps you even learn how to do that in a way that is collaborative because that in and of itself is also a skill that's important to develop. But let's say your partner doesn't adjust because they are just triggered and they want you to, uh, they want you to fix them. They want you to agree to something, to their view of how everything went down. And if you don't relent in terms of seeing things their way, then they're not going to come back down to a, to a grounded place. So you could see how in a situation like that, no matter what you're doing as an avoidant person who's trying to meet their partner, you may still find yourself uh, with someone who isn't actually willing or capable to evolve the relationship with you to a better place. Let's talk about the flip side. So let's say as an anxious person, a wave, you decide, all right, I'm not going to lean in so much. I'm going to, I'm going to try to stand my ground, try to stay collaborative without leaning in so much that I push my partner away. And you also figure out how to do that and how to stay collaborative. And you start to identify the ways that you habitually, um, reach out for your partner and, um, and you, you reel that all in. You start to um, find ways to, to uh, be a little bit more boundaried with your, with your partner. And that's, that can be really challenging for someone who is anxious because if you're boundaried, you start to feel isolated. And, and we rely on connection with each other, especially in relationship, to, to help ourselves feel safe. There's nothing inherently wrong with finding 
safety in the connection. What's challenging is when you're dependent on that so that if you start to sense your partner pulling away, um, then it freaks you out. Well, you can see how that would make it really challenging to to get past those those places. Hopefully you see that. So let's say you figure out how to how to stay more boundaried, how to how to engage and be collaborative. And yet, if your avoidant partner never learns to not avoid, never learns not to retreat, if they don't learn how to stay engaged, if they don't learn how to stop blaming you, um, if they don't learn how to tune into you emotionally so that you can actually have a conversation about what's happening, then uh, it's possible that, again, you will never be able to evolve your relationship to a place that's uh, resolved whatever issues it is you're dealing with. So it's important to tease apart what is yours and where it's still on your partner to show up because you are in a relationship after after all. And a relationship, for the sake of this conversation, is about two people. It's about people who are showing up for each other. Otherwise, you might ask yourself, why are you even in this relationship? It doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're totally wrapped up in each other and you don't have lives independent of each other, you know, that you can't do your own thing. Of course you can. Of course, that's, that's part of being an actualized individual. Likewise, it doesn't mean that you're so boundaried that you don't figure out how to do things in ways that are together and fun and playful and really engaged with each other and, and feeling union and transcendence and all of those beautiful things that you can feel when you're together, right? Like if you didn't have either of those things, then it would be, I think, really challenging to have a relationship that feels good for the long haul, right? Because if you were missing either of those things, then you would probably start to feel that something was missing and that something could be some element of togetherness or it could be some element of separateness, both of those things being really important for a successful relationship. So I want to talk a little bit more about how you tease those things apart um, so that you know what's yours and what isn't yours. Uh, but for, first, I would like to take a moment so that I can tell you about this week's sponsor. But before we talk about this week's sponsor, did you happen to catch episode 233 of the show where I spoke with Marlo Thomas and Phil Donahue? You may recall that we talked about their book, What Makes a Marriage Last?, which they wrote in celebration of having been married for 40 years. For their book, they had conversations with 40 famous couples about the reality of their lives and how they've been able to both survive and thrive in their marriage. Well, Marlo and Phil recently released a podcast called Double Date, where you can eavesdrop in on many of the conversations that they had for their book, getting real about topics like family, career, conflict, addiction, jealousy, illness, everything under the sun. Whether they're chatting with Sting and Trudy Styler, Neil Patrick Harris and David Burtka, Viola Davis and Julius Tenen, Judges Judy and Jerry Scheinlin, and more, you'll be entertained and get some great insights about how real life and well-known couples make their marriages work. Check out Double Date with Marlo Thomas and Phil Donahue wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you haven't heard episode 233 yet, make sure you check that out too. You can find that by visiting relationshipalive.com slash double date. Okay, now let's move on to this week's sponsor. I'm really appreciating their commitment to the podcast and to you as they're continuing their special offer for Relationship Alive listeners, which you'll hear about in just a moment. Sometimes I just need a break from all the research and reading that I do for Relationship Alive. And one of my favorite ways to decompress is to curl up on the couch with my new kitty cat. Her name is Moshi. 
we call her Mosh Mosh, or with a special someone or both and get lost in a fun show. And one way that I like to change things up a bit from your typical fare is to watch brilliant TV from across the pond and beyond. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the different sensibilities and ways of telling stories that they have in other countries or the kick-ass soundtracks with familiar or intriguing new music. I don't know, but it's different and it's really entertaining. And it's one reason that I really enjoy Acorn TV. Acorn TV is a streaming service that's rooted in British television, but unlike other British streaming services, it also has content from Ireland, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and beyond. They have a rich catalog of exclusive award-winning series across genres, so they have mysteries, dramas, comedies, and more. You may have heard me mention that if you're a fan of quirky British comedy that, like I am, then the other one is a must-watch. It's full of hilarious, brutally honest moments that come up in life and relationships. Fortunately, it's really funny. And if you're a Downton Abbey fan, the other one features a masterfully uh, comic performance from Siobhan Finneran, who played the crafty maid Sarah O'Brien on Downton. Plus, you get access to all of this new, different content for a fraction of the cost compared to most streaming services at just $5.99 a month. And as a Relationship Alive listener, they have a special offer for you. You can escape to Britain and beyond without leaving your home and try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code, which is ALIVE. That's A-C-O-R-N, acorn, dot, T-V, code ALIVE, to get your first 30 days for free. And thank you so much, Acorn TV, for your support of the Relationship Alive podcast. So how do you figure out what's yours, and how do you figure out if a relationship is is worth sticking with. Let's face it, ending a relationship is challenging. I think it's it's really hard. If you're really in it on some level, then making the decision to not be in it any longer is hard, especially because you care about the person. Now, it, it might be slightly easier for an avoidant person because... On some level, the uh, wanting to escape the stress of a, of a relationship that isn't going so well, that comes naturally, right, to someone who's an island, who's avoidant. But that being said, once, uh, once an anxious person, the wave can get over the fear of being alone and uh, abandonment, then... Uh, Also, ending a really challenging relationship can feel like a relief, but that doesn't make it any easier to do. And so this isn't a decision that I think anyone should make lightly. And at the same time, if you've been tuning into some of my more recent episodes, you're probably getting the sense that I do think it's worth asking ourselves the question if this is a time in this particular relationship, if this is a time to commit no matter what, or if it might be a chance to look at the relationship and say, hey, this has, maybe this has run its course. Maybe we've learned all we were meant to learn together. Maybe we've created all we were meant to create together. Maybe there's a way for us to go our separate ways uh, that would actually feel a lot better than driving each other crazy trying to make it work. I think these are reasonable questions to be asking. And it's something that we're, we're probably going to talk more about here on the show. So how do you know? How do you know if you're there? Well, step one is to do what we were talking about earlier, to be willing to ask yourself the question, what am I responsible for here? And 
that could be an inner inquiry where the answers come to you. It could be something that you ask your partner. What could I do? What could I do to make this easier? What do you see happening? Generally, you want to ask them that at a better time. Like you wouldn't want to ask them that in the middle of of a big hullabaloo. Um, so in a better moment, you might say, hey, uh, I noticed that we've been having a lot of conflict lately and it's really uncomfortable. And I'm just wondering if you're noticing anything about me that I might be able to do differently that would help the situation or that would help you in this situation. You might get some valuable information there. You might not. The biggest thing is to just be open, to be open to the information that you're receiving. Or if you have good friends or family who have observed a lot of your relationship, they may have some ideas for you as well. Now, whether it's your own opinion or someone else's opinion, it's always worth taking it with a grain of salt, right? Um, meaning it might be right, it might not be right. The way that you find out is to test it, to test it and see, does this, if I change this thing, does it make a difference? What kind of difference does it make? It's a process, right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna be an instant fix, probably. It's a process that you go through. So no matter where you're entering this conversation, it might be worth giving yourself a time limit for this process. Like, okay, I'm gonna spend 90 days unearthing all the ways that I'm contributing to this situation. And I'm going to do my best to figure out ways to break my own patterns and to bring a different, a healthier version of me to this situation. And so that would probably involve the things that I've been talking about um, up until now. Hopefully, you can also involve your partner in this conversation. Hopefully, you can get your partner to recognize, oh, yeah, you do this and I do that. And if you can get them to step into the dialogue with you, that's a huge step in the right direction. Because as I was mentioning before our sponsorship break, in the end, it's important for your partner to also join you in this dance. At least it's important to me. You have to decide for yourself how important it is for you. And I think if you're asking yourself the question and you've given yourself a, a decent amount of time to truly make changes and to get guidance and support in doing that, um, so it's because I can't tell you the number of people who have said to me like, oh, I've, you know, I've tried everything. And then I'll say, well, did you try this? And then they'll be like, no. And I'll say like, oh, well, did you try this? No, I didn't try that. Did you try this? No. You see where I'm going with this, right? Often we're limited by our perspectives, by our, by our sense of what is possible. So it can be really helpful when you're trying to change, whether it's a book or a coach or a therapist or a friend who seems to know their shit, um, whoever it is, however it is that you come about new sources of information, that can be so helpful in breaking your own patterns, changing your habitual ways of confronting a situation. So let's say you're doing that and your partner has been willing to also be in this dialogue with you and to look at their own patterns if it were me, I would start to observe and see how much is my partner willing to take this on for themselves? How much are they willing to look at their own patterns, their own habits? How much are they willing to try and change? How much are they willing to reach out for help and support? And how patient am I in relationship to what I see as the pace of their journey? Because sometimes it can take us a while to change if change is truly what we want to do. 
And if it's truly what we want to do, it can happen quickly or it can take a while. For me, I'm I tend to be really encouraged if I see that the other person is willing and trying and is in the conversation with me. That's that's the important thing. I can I can be super patient in situations like that. However, as you start dealing with different degrees of your partner not being willing to address what's going on, not being willing to address the larger dynamic, not being willing to get support as a couple, not being willing to do anything differently, not being willing to take any responsibility for themselves, not being willing to talk with you about a vision for your future that sounds appealing to you on on some level. What are you going to do at that point? Right? You have to make a choice at some point. And the way that you gather information for making that choice, maybe it's your intuition. Maybe it's talking to trusted people. Maybe it's gathering evidence in or lack of evidence in the way that I've been talking about. In fact, it might be helpful for you to step back and say, in my life, Like in the areas where I feel really confident about making decisions, how do I make decisions? And you might identify the ways that you make decisions in other areas of your life that are a little less close to your core, to your core wounding. Um, And then borrow from that and see, see how you can take from like let's say you're really good at making decisions at work like how how can you borrow from the way that you make decisions at work to make better decisions in this situation if you're agonizing and agonizing and agonizing for long stretches of time despite giving time and energy to your own development then that might be an answer for you Oh, I I can see this isn't going to change. I will probably keep agonizing as long as this is going on. Now, the agonizing kind of ebbs and flows, and it's mostly like, actually, it's, it's getting better. It's getting better all the time. Sometimes it still sucks, but generally the trajectory is positive. Then that might be a sign that staying is great. It's like perfectly reasonable. If you're in one of those rare situations where you change and grow and everything does transform for the better and it actually didn't require anything of your partner, awesome. Like, no reason to throw that out just because it was all on you. Like, go for it. Take that. Take that win and run with it. See where you can thrive now. But if it's not getting any better or things aren't changing, or you've stumbled up against something that might just be representative of a core difference that you have with your partner, I'm talking about like a deal breaker difference, then there may be a tough decision in your future. The tough decision being to either move on or the tough decision to stay in a situation and contend with all the ways that your your inner world won't let you settle. It can be surprising, I think. It, these are the kinds of things that we see often when we're outside of a relationship. All the ways that we were willing to bend and accommodate and compromise and really try, really try, because we love our partner and we want to make things work and yet it can still be quite a relief afterwards to not have to bend quite so much to not have to accommodate quite so much and to give a little bit more faith to the possibility that you will meet someone who is better matched for you if that's the path that you choose now if you're an island, you might still find another wave. If you're a wave, you might still find another island. Like, that's possible. 
And if you're securely attached, you might find someone who isn't securely attached, right? That That's still totally possible. The problem isn't inherently the attachment style. The problem is how you rise to the occasion and what you do with it. And if you and your partner are willing to work with each other, you can be great together. And in fact, the process of doing that with each other and working towards healthier boundaries in both directions, both healthier connection and healthier separation, then you can evolve yourself to being securely attached in your relationship. That's totally possible if you're engaged in that process. And if you're not engaged, but your partner is, then at some point you're probably going to have to decide if you're going to sign up or not because your partner is probably going to get tired of waiting for you. And if you're doing the work and your partner isn't, then you're probably going to get tired at some point of that. I can't predict what will happen in the future, but what I can say is that the more that you stay true to doing the work and being willing to look objectively at how you are being met and how that stacks up against the kind of relationship that you really want, that's going to lead you in the right direction for you. I can't make those choices for you. But I have faith that you can. I hope this has been helpful for you. And I look forward to hearing from you. And if, uh, if this has made a difference, uh, or if you have other questions, we can do a follow-up episode. You can always write to me, Neilius, N-E-I-L-I-U-S, at neilsatin.com. And otherwise, take care until the next time I see you here on Relationship Alive. <laughs>